Hi and welcome again from me, Lorenz Erasmus. Today we are going to look at one of the prophets that I really enjoy reading. Now, for quite a long time in my life, it was one of those that you look at the book of Ezekiel and because it sounds a lot like history and uh, you do not know how to interpret it. It was very difficult for me at first to understand it until one day it just started breaking open for me and I could now find that it's probably one of the best books in the Bible that I enjoy reading most. Now. A lot of people would say, what are you doing still in the Old Testament? Now, I want to quote a little history. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he tells them a story. And he says, there's a rich man that lived in this magnificent house. And outside his gate there was a very poor man by the name of Lazarus and they both died and when the rich man opened his eyes he saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abram but the rich man really had a problem he was getting very hot very thirsty and he asked Father Abram and he said can't you send Lazarus to me so that he can just bring me some water. And Abram said to him, Sorry, I can't, because there's a huge ravine between the two of us, and it's impossible to move from the one side to the other side. And then the rich man asked something else, and he said, Listen, can't you send Lazarus down just to warn my brothers and tell them that hell is a reality. There is a place where you will end up if you do not uh, give your heart to the Lord. And Abram said to him, it's impossible to do that because they've got Moses and they've got the prophets. Now these words come from Jesus. Now Jesus is saying to his disciples, if they don't listen to Moses or the prophets, there is no chance of them getting into heaven. Now in our day and age, most theologians that you talk to will say, oh, let's forget about the Old Testament. Throw it out, just read the New Testament and see how the church reacted. No, you cannot get to know the Lord if you do not know the Old Testament. So that is one of the problems that I've got with church today is that they are throwing out the baby with the wash dish water or wash water or whatever. So, they do not know what it means to repent, to come to a position in your life where you can say to the Lord, I'm here, just take me, take my life, I hand it over to you, and do with it as you please. Because you can only understand that when you go through and you read through books like Ezekiel, books like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Daniel, to find out that the Lord wants total repentance. He wants your total being to be handed over to Him so that He can do with you as He likes. Now, that is why I actually enjoy going back to the Old Testament and reading the prophets and to see what it actually says. And the thing that I found when it started, when I read through Ezekiel, was that there is such a... Uh, if we compare the two, there are so many similarities between Ezekiel and Revelation that it's actually quite funny if you look at it and you see, but the book of Revelation, there was nothing new. If you read the book of Ezekiel, you will know what will happen in the end times. You don't have to look at the book of Revelation. But like the book of Enoch was thrown out by our learned clergy 300 years after Christ because they said we only needed one book to tell us what the future holds. They didn't understand it's Ezekiel because Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all those books tell us what will happen 
in the time to come. But being part of the Old Testament, it was thrown out and said, oh, we don't need to really read it because it's history. So I want to look at the book of Ezekiel today and just to see what the Lord was trying to show Ezekiel. What, uh, what he was trying to tell him through that book. Because you will find that most people that I know of, fortunately, still believe that Ezekiel's temple has never been built. And you will find today in Jerusalem people are uh, trying to get the right lambs so that when they build Ezekiel's temple that they have the right lambs to slaughter for the Lord. They go through and they, that's what one of the major fights is about between the Arabs and the Jews in Jerusalem is over the Mount Zion because the Jews want to build Ezekiel's temple there and they say half of it is in the hands of the Arabs and that is one of the conflicts going on now for the past 50, 60 years, 70 years, if not more. Now, we know that temple has never been built, so yes, we know that there is still things to happen. In Ezekiel, but I want to go through it chapter by chapter and tell you what is still going to happen as well, or how we can use that to our own benefit as New Testament Christians, as people of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, we start off with chapter 1, and that is a very difficult chapter for most people to understand because here we see a vision of God. Now, the Lord said, You cannot see me unless you die. But yet, yeah, Ezekiel actually sees the Lord, and he didn't die. That is the first thing that came to mind, is that, oh, Ezekiel saw him, but he didn't die. But the same thing happened to John, when he was sitting uh, before he got the book of Revelation. Who did he see? He saw Jesus in all his glory, talking to him. And I want to quote that portion in Revelation and tell you, show you the uh, similarity. He says, uh, his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in the furnace, and his voice <clears throat> was like the sound of many waters. His right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, this comes out of Revelation. That is what John saw. So he saw the Lord. What did Ezekiel see? He said, also, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. Whenever it stood still, they dropped their wings. So, yeah, it's this majestic vision that Ezekiel sees, and he sees the Lord. And what did the Lord say to him? And he said to him, uh, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. What happened? And I think that is the thing that everybody that has ever been so close to the Lord has confirmed, is when Ezekiel saw the Lord, he fell down on his face. And here the Lord says to him, stand on your feet. When John saw this vision, he fell down on his face and the Lord said to him, stand up that I can talk to you. We find Daniel, when Daniel is out there and he sees the Lord, he falls down, he says, he felt like a dead man when he fell down and the Lord said to him stand up I want to talk to you so these are the sort of things that happen when you see the Lord you you find you do not have any strength left in yourself because of the vision that you've seen but it just confirms that whenever anybody has seen the Lord they fell down like a dead man now that is basically chapter 1. It's this huge vision and it's repeated in chapter 10 where the Lord departs from Ezekiel again. So if we look at what is the rest, chapter 2, he says, uh, then he said to me, son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Here we see the vision, 
and the Lord says to you, Ezekiel, I'm sending you to your own people. He's sending them, in today's words, to the church. Not to people in Asia or in Africa who's never heard of the Lord. He's sending us to our own people to say, this is what the word of the Lord says. Why? Because the people who are supposed to be children of God don't know the word of God. And this is what is happening to Ezekiel. And he says the same thing to John in Revelation. He says, I'm sending you to the seven churches, not to the people somewhere on an island that has never heard of the Lord. No, he says, I'm sending you to the seven, ch seven churches. Go and tell them what is going to happen. And tell them what is wrong with them. And this is the whole thing that we find throughout Ezekiel. The Lord says, this is what is wrong with you. And this is what you need to do to repent for me to come back into your life again. Now, if we look at Ezekiel's calling, and I want to read a couple of verses here. Verse 10 in chapter 3. He says, Moreover he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all my words, words which I will speak to you, and listen closely. To John he says, go and write it down. To Jer Jeremiah the Lord says, write in a book everything that I'm going to show to you. The same words, listen to the words that I'm going to talk to you. And then he goes on and he says, At the end of seven days the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of your hand. Very, very bad words. The Lord says, if I say to you, go and do something, go and warn my people, go and warn my church that they have to come back. If you don't do it, the Lord will require their blood from you when you die one day. But he says, go out and warn the people. Tell them what is wrong with them. Tell them what is happening to them. Why they should change and what they should change to. If they don't and you have warned them, that's fine. But if you do not warn them, he will require their blood from our hands. So, if we finish this thing, he says, Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he will die in his sin, and his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered, but his blood I will require from your hand. Again here, yeah, the same story. If you warn people, if you tell them what is wrong, and they change, they will save themselves. If they don't, they have had the chance to change. And this is really the start of what Ezekiel is all about. is this calling to say, come and listen to what I'm going to say. Now, when we get to chapter 4, now when we look at chapter 16, it is actually painting us a picture of how the Lord loves Jerusalem. It goes through to say that he saw this woman uh, lying in its own blood and everybody walking past it and he picked it up and he gave it everything it needed. And that is really the story of the church and of Israel. What we find is that we didn't go looking for God. He came to look for us, to pick us up, to take us into His care, and to really do everything that we wanted. And yet, we still move away. We still find different things to do. And it's the same thing that happened to Israel. And here he goes in and he says how she actually started a harlot. Now a lot of people say in 
if we look at Revelation, they say we cannot believe this harlot that is mentioned there. Yet in Ezekiel, it's mentioned exactly the same. That Israel, Jerusalem became a harlot. So the church became a harlot. And that is what the whole story in Revelation is all about. But then he comes with some very uh, apt descriptions that we still find throughout history and still find even where I'm sitting in South Africa today. We still find it happening. It says, when you built your shrine at the beginnings of every street and made your high place in every square in disdaining, uh, in disdaining money, you were not like a harlot. Now, you just have to drive through so many small little towns in South Africa and the first thing you will find is there's a church building. You will see it from far off. And the same thing happened to Israel. They also built their own shrines. And even though they knew that they only had one place to go to, and that was the temple in Jerusalem, we find that Ezekiel is saying, in every little town that you've got, you built your own shrine, where you could go up and say, we will go and serve the Lord there, but we will not go to Jerusalem. And that's what we find today in our lives as well. We say, oh, we will do it our way. We will build our own little church system where we are we don't need to go to to the lord in jerusalem and find out exactly what he wants from us so yes what will happen we will be abused by the lord he will actually come down on the church and say i do not want this but there will be something else he says from verse 60 he says nevertheless i will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth and i will establish an everlasting covenant with you then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you received your sisters both your older and your younger and i will give them to you as daughters but not because of your covenant thus i will establish my covenant with you and you will know that I am the Lord, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth any more because of your humili humiliation, when I have forgiven you for all that you have done, the Lord God declares. What a nice way to, to get that. Yes, even though we build harlots, we build our own systems, the Lord says there will come a time when you will forgive everything. And he will build his church in Jerusalem. And we will look back at our lives and say, how could we have done those things? But yet, the Lord is there to forgive. And he will forgive. And he will take us back and bring us under his wings again. Which is probably the best uh, promise that we can ever receive. Now, chapter 17, he continues with a parable about an eagle and a vine where the vine was planted and by one eagle and it moved off and another eagle came around and the vine showed its face to that eagle and ignored it again the lord says i've done everything i want in your life i've given you i've given you birth and yet you turn away from me and that is what this whole chapter is all about to say yes go back to your first choice to the one that gives life don't go after anybody that doesn't give you life then chapter 18 is quite a good chapter in ezekiel because it tells us that everybody has a personal choice i cannot go to hell because of what my father did or what my children did I can only go to hell because of what I did, but I can also go to heaven because of what I did. And I can't get there because of what my fathers did or what my children is going to do. It's, there's a personal choice for everyone on earth that we have to decide if we want to serve the Lord or not. And that is what this whole chapter is all about, to give us that personal choice. And if you don't do it, there's a lamentation in chapter 19 to say, why didn't you do it? And we all know that a lamination is something where people cry out. So that is what's going to happen if you don't do the right choice.
if you don't make that right choice. Chapter 20, we find in verse 10, um, he says, So I took you out of the land of Egypt and brought you into the wilderness. I gave them my statues and informed them of my ordinances, by which if a man observes them, he will live. I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, and they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statues, and they rejected my ordinances, by which if a man observes them, he will live. And my Sabbaths they greatly profaned. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to annihilate them. Yeah, the Lord goes back. And he says, let's look at history to see what has happened. Now, I always enjoy it when I find these sort of passages to say, yes, the Lord wants us to look back at history, to see what is wrong, what went wrong with Israel, why, if we look at a book like Ezekiel, why are there so many things wrong in Jerusalem? And why are all these threats there? And all these prophecies of bad things going to happen. Because, he says, look at the history. That's what we find here in a couple of verses that I just read to you as well. Is the Lord says, even your forefathers did the same thing. And now you're going through the same things again. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, let's look at Israel and their example. So that we don't go off and do the same things that they did. Yeah, we find Ezekiel saying to them, Look at your forefathers, look what they did. And you're doing the same things again. So it's a repeat of repeat. So the one thing I want to make 100% sure here today as well, that you understand, is that a prophecy is not a thing of what will happen starting at a certain day and ending at another day. Israel lived a prophecy. And whatever happened to them will happen to every person in his life. And that is what it, what makes a prophecy such an, uh, how can I put it, such an important thing in our lives. Because that prophecy will become true in everybody's life. And it might happen to you now, and it might happen in somebody else's lives, life five years from now. So a prophecy will always stay a prophecy and it will always start at the beginning and start and end at the end and that's what Ezekiel is saying here as well look at Israel they were led from Egypt and the Lord took them into the wilderness you will be taken from Egypt and you will be led into the wilderness and I will be taken from Egypt and I will be led into the wilderness that same the same steps will apply and yet yes the Lord will come to us again and say listen there's something wrong in your lives Look at what I did to Israel and then see if you find the same things in your own life and fix it. So that is what a prophecy is all about and that is what Ezekiel is saying here. Look at the history and see what they did and go and fix it. Uh, look at verse 36. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you, uh, you unto the bond of the covenant. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. Here yeah, the Lord says the same thing. He says, when Israel came to the border with the promised land, they said, we don't want to enter. And the Lord will bring you to that point as well. And he will say, are you sheep or are you a goat? Do you want, to, like a sheep, to be led into the promised land where you will serve me? Or are you a goat? Are you going to rebel and say, I'm not going in there. There is too many problems in that side of the river. And what happened to those that did it? They were killed. Their sons entered into Israel only because of the covenant of the Lord. But they themselves, their whole families, were wiped out in the desert. And that is what the Lord is saying here. Are you sheep or are you goat? 
which way are you going to do? Are you going to rebel against me or are you going to allow me to take hold of your life and take you where you should be? Now, chapter 21, the Lord says one thing. Verse 9, he says, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, say, A sword, a sword sharpened and also polished, sharpened to make a slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Or shall you rejoice, the rod of my son, despise every tree? Yeah, the Lord says again, His word is the sword of life. And if we see the vision that John saw in Revelation, he describes it and he says, I saw Jesus, I saw him clothed in white and he had white hair and everything. And from his mouth came a sword. Now the sword is this thing, it's the Bible, it's the word of God. And whatever is in here will judge you one day. Because everything that we need for life is in this book, is in this book. And he says, that is what is going to come against you. If you do not believe that the Lord will do it, listen to this verse again. L look at what Jesus is saying. There are so many people saying, please, the word of the Lord is the two-edged sword. And it will cut between marrow and the bone. So it will cut between everything. You cannot hide anything from the Lord. Look at this word and judge yourself before you are being judged by the Lord. That is really what it is. Chapter 22, we continue. And here we find that the Lord continues and He tells Israel what is wrong with Him. And we find the same thing in Revelation. The Lord continually telling the church what is wrong with Him, what they should be fixing. And eventually He gets through in Ezekiel and He says another example. There's two women, two sisters, Ahola and Holiba. And the one people say is Samara, uh, was Samariah and the other one was uh, Judah. If we look at their names and we look at the meaning of the names, the first name Ahola actually means her tent which says it's the tabernacle that they had. And then a holy bulb means my tent in her. Now we've just read a verse a couple of minutes ago where the Lord says he will take out your heart of flesh and give you a heart of, uh, your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So he will put his tabernacle in you. And again we find the next example that the older sister played the harlot. And so did the younger sister. And that is what is wrong with us. Israel, with the tent uh, in Jerusalem, played the harlot. They went off to other people and other gods. And now we find him saying, the church, exactly the same thing. You will get a heart of flesh, but you will still go and play the harlot. That is the message of chapter 23. Now we get to chapter 24. Okay, now we get to chapter 24, where we find more judgments and more comparisons of Israel. And next couple of us, uh, chapters we will go through fairly quickly, because we did that in the previous section where we spoke about the different churches. So here we find from chapter 25, we find judgments against Ammon, against Moab, against Edom, Edom being the Jews of today, against Sidon, Tyre or Philistia, which is the church in Philistia, which we spent quite a lot of time on. And chapter 27, we actually find that a lot of people say, yes, okay, now we know who the Satan is and where he came from, but it's part of the judgment against the church of Philistia. So now we find out that Satan is revealed as in chapter 28 as actually being the king of the church in Philistia. So that's why I say the name it, claim it and frame it theologians, they serve Satan because they don't know it. Because he is the king of that church. Then we go on to chapter 30 
and here we find the uh, prophecy against the church in Egypt and it continues in chapter 31 where we find that they became a big tree and we can compare that tree to the one in Daniel and you will find that it is more or less the same tree that is described there because the church in Egypt is such a big tree, uh, church but yet they will be cut down and even the people in Israel will look at the church in Egypt and that's what we find today is the people sitting in Egypt is such a vast group of people and everybody looking at them and saying yes we want to be like them but they will be cut down uh, chapter 32 the major issues there we find from verse 17 is in the 20th year in this on the 17th of the or 15th of the month the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man wail for the wards of Egypt and bring it down her and the daughters of the powerful nations to the nether world to those who go down to the pit who do you surpass in beauty? Go down and make your bed with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of those who are slain by the sword. She is given over to the sword. They have drawn her and all her hordes away. The strong among the mighty ones shall speak of him and his helpers for the midst of Sheol. They have gone down. They lie still, the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Assyria is there and all her company, her graves are round about her. All of them are slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the remotest part of the pit and her uh, company is round about her grave. All of them are slain, fallen by the sword, who spread terror in the land of the living. Elam is there and all her hordes are round her grave, all of them slain fallen by the sword, who went down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth, who installed their terror in the land of the living and bore their disgrace with those who went down to the pit. They have made a bed with her among the slain and all the hordes. Her graves are around her. They are all circumcised, slain by the sword, although their terror was installed in the land of the living, and they bore their disgrace with those who are who have gone down, who go down to the pit, they were put in the midst of the slain. Meshech, Tubal, and all their hordes are there. The graves are surround them. And so he continues. Now all these nations around Israel, all these church groupings will end up in Ezekiel puts it in Sheol, hell, wherever, if they do not change. So that is the message for you for today is if you find that you are in one of these churches, rather go over to Jerusalem. There will be so many judgments against Jerusalem, but there's one difference. Jerusalem will be with the Lord and she will be made to live again. Where all the other churches, the church in Egypt, the church in Assyria, church and tyrants, they will all end up in the pit with the devil. Yes, unfortunately, that is what it's all about. Now, chapter 33, I'll just leave it there. Chapter 33, verse 12, the Lord says something again. He says, and you, son of man, say to your fellow citizens, the righteousness of a righteous man will not deliver him in the day of his transgressions. And as far as the wickedness of the wicked, he will not stumble because of it in the day when he turns from his wickedness, whereas a righteous man will not be able to live by his righteousness on the day when he commits the sin. Yeah, the Lord comes back to Ezekiel and he says, Listen, I chose you to warn these people. And that is what I feel today. When we look at the previous chapter and we see what is going to happen to all these people that do not believe in everything that the Bible says, the sword, and that was the message there, will be against you.
and you will go down into Sheol or into hell and that is where your life will end if you do not change. Now, that is chapter 33. Ezekiel is again called as a watchman. If we look at verse 30, it says, But as for you, son of man, your fellow citizens who talk about you by the walls and the doorway of their houses speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, Come now and hear what the message is that comes from the Lord. So that is what I would like you to do, is take out this message and take it out to your brothers and tell everybody what is really standing in the Bible. Now, chapter 34, we've done in the previous video where it was against the shepherds. So what happens to those people who actually teach you and who do not understand the word of the Lord? They will be judged. But again, the Lord says, He will raise a new shepherd that will take us into Jerusalem. Chapter 35 is a chapter devoted to Israel of today, to Edom, to what will happen to the Jews of today. You can go and read it. I don't want to spend any more time on it. We've already spoken about Edom or the Jews of today. And now we come to some good news. Chapter 36, verse 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, you will, be put, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn you, and, I will be, and you will be cultivated and sown. I will multiply men on you, all the house of Israel, all of it and the cities will be inhabited, and the waste places will be rebuilt. I will multiply on you man and beast, and they will increase and be fruitful, and I will cause you to be inhabited as you were formerly, and will treat you better than the first. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. What a nice promise to say that, yes, the Lord will build us. Once we've gone through this process, we've judged ourselves, we've been judged by the sword, we know what the Bible says. Guess what? There's a huge change waiting in your life that only the Lord can do. So that is one of the blessings. Verse 19, he says the following, he says, Also I scattered them among the nations, and they, will, they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name, because it was said of them, These are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. Now the Lord says, Yes, some of your people will go off to the other nations, but guess what? He will call you from those nations and call you back into Israel. And that is possibly the best word I can leave for you you with today as well is that even if you sit in Egypt and you say Lord but I think I've done everything right he will call you from the church in Egypt and call you to Jerusalem and you will be settled in Jerusalem that is probably the best message out of this apart from chapter 37 and now a lot of people say how do we interpret this? Now we have to go back to Revelation. And in Revelation, John says there will be a resurrection of the dead. And this is what is happening in chapter 37 in Ezekiel. Once all these judgments have been passed on the church, what will happen? Those that have died in the Lord will stand up. And that is what chapter 37 is all about. Where Ezekiel sees these bones lying in the desert. And the Lord says, start prophesying to them. And we find the bones coming together again. We find flesh around them again. And then the Spirit of the Lord is blown into them. And here we have the resurrection of the dead, where we will have one kingdom and one king. And that king is Jesus Christ, who will reign over us. Chapter 38 we find exact 
exactly the same thing in uh, Revelation, where we find Satan sitting and saying, at the end of the days, he will, we first find that the church will be living in a thousand year reign with nobody actually attacking them or doing anything. But then at the end of that time, uh, Satan will rise. And that is with his hordes coming from Choch and Gog and Magog, I suppose in English. You have to excuse me my pronunciation at times. Uh, these people will come up against Israel or the church and they will fight against Israel. And in chapter 39, we find that Satan and all his hordes are destroyed, annihilated, completely wiped off the earth. And in verse 12, it says as follows, For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Now, this recording is being made about two weeks after the major earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Now we know that people are still looking for the dead there. But yeah, the Bible says it will take seven months to cleanse the earth from all the people that have died. They are hoping to finish sometime this week, next week, with burying all the dead which is only three weeks. Three weeks is a short period of time, as opposed to seven months that people will be burying them. Then, verse 17, he comes back, Ezekiel, and he says, As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and every beast of the field. Assemble and come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I am going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of the mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats and bulls, all of them uh, fatlings of Bashan. So everybody will be, the dead will be allowed to be eaten by all the animals on the earth. Verse 21, we find that, and I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. Here the glory of the Lord comes. And then we end up with chapters 40 to 48, where the Lord says one thing. He says, I will bring a new temple. John sees a new Jerusalem. One written for the New Testament where they believe that Jerusalem was everything and in Ezekiel a new temple because that is where the Lord was. So that is the comparison between Ezekiel and Revelation. Thank you very much. Now when we get to chapter 4, we find something that I think a lot of people will not like. The Lord tells Jeremiah that uh, Ezekiel that he has to lie on his one side for 390 days and then on his other side for 40 days for Judah. And I don't know about you, but I have problems just lying on my one side for probably 10 or 15 minutes at a night. What, let alone 390 days that he has to lie on his one side. And the other thing is, as well, I like making food. Now, even if I have some dough, I will put it on the kettle bry outside or barbecue and put a piece of wood in just to get a little bit more flavor. Now, the Lord tells Ezekiel he has to use human poop to bake it on. And then the Lord says, okay, change it. You can use cow manure. Now, I don't think I would like to have bread for 390 days on end. 
that has been baked on cow manure. Because you just have to walk in the felt and f walk past some cattle and find this horrible, horrible stench coming from where they are. And now you have to bake your bread in that. But that is, yeah, that's not my cup of tea. That's all I can say. But yet, the Lord says to Ezekiel, that is what you're going to do. You're going to lie on your one side for 390 days and then on your, 40 si on your other side for 40 days for, for Judah. Now, yeah, he had to do it and he did it because it came from the Lord and that was something that he had to do. Now, the next chapter, chapter 5, all of a sudden we see that the Lord says, he will bring the sword against Jerusalem. Now, who is Jerusalem? That is the church with him. That is really where the temple was. But yet he will judge the people of Jerusalem. And in our day and age today, if we look at who's in Jerusalem, it's the church. The church is in Jerusalem. Those people that have done everything right, but yet we do something wrong. And that is why the Lord says he will do it. He says, therefore fathers will eat their sons among you, and sons will eat their fathers. For I will execute judgment on you and scatter all your remnant to every wind. So as I live, declares the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with your detestable idols and with all your abominations, therefore I will also withdraw and my eye will have no pity and I will not spare. Here the Lord says a major thing. He says there's so many things wrong with us as church that we have to start looking at ourselves and find out what is wrong in our lives. As Christians, do we have any other idols that we run after? Do we run after the best clothing that we can find? Do we run after the best house that we can find? Do we run after money? What do we run after? Even as Christians, we all have something every now and then that we find is very important in our lives. So the Lord says, no, that is why I will uh, test you, because I want to be the one and only being in your life. I want to be number one. Not your house, not your wife, not your children. I want to be number one. Because the moment I am number one in your life, then it will be a lot easier for me to look after your wife and your children and your house and all your belongings. Because then you come to me and you know that everything that you've got is from me. And then the Lord has an obligation to actually look after that which belongs to you. And that is what the Lord is trying to tell us here. Now, chapter 6, he continues with more judgments. In verse 8, however, he says one thing. He says, however, I will leave a remnant, for you will have those who escape the sword among the nations when you are scattered among the countries. There's a promise of a remnant that will be left for us. To say yes there are certain people and I'm pretty sure some of the people that are listening to this today and watching this DVD if you've done everything right the Lord says I know that but you might still be scattered amongst people and say but I don't fit in with these people I don't fit in with those people I don't really want to work with those people at church yes the Lord says you will be scattered you will not find a place where you will be comfortable because the moment we feel comfortable we start putting up idols so the more uncomfortable we are where we are the better for us and that is what the Lord is saying to us here this oh sorry chapter 7 if we look at verse 25 I think there's another big one he says when anguish comes they will seek peace but there will be none so here again the Lord says those in Jerusalem will actually try and seek peace, but there will be no peace. And that is what we find today. I just have to look at most of the forums that I look at on a ad hoc basis to see how many times we as Christians are being taken on. And you never left alone. You might say something and all of a sudden the forum is closed because of what you said, or you find unbelievers or even people that believe that they are 
Christians take you on for your views. And yes, that is what Ezekiel also had. Now, then we come to chapter 8. And again, uh, this whole section continually looks at the church, at what is wrong with it. And we look at uh, chapter 8, verse 9 and 9. He says, And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations they are commanding here. That was in the temple. So I entered, and look and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the walls, on the wall all around. Standing in front of them were seventy elders of the house of Israel, with Jozana, the son of Sephon, standing among them, each man with his sense in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the door? Each man in, the, in his own room of his carved images, for they say, The Lord does not see, the Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, Yet you will see still greater abominations which uh, they are committing. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, You see this, son of man? you will see still greater abominations than these. Yeah, Jeremiah is taken in the spirit into the temple. And he sees all these things that are wrong in the temple. And the people are saying, we can do these small little things, pretty sure the Lord won't complain about it. But the Lord knows everything. You can be such a good Christian on a Sunday, but be a devil at home, the Lord knows about it. Because... He can see everywhere. He will see, and he looks at the heart of people. And he says here, yeah, the woman were uh, crying over Tammuz. Now, she was the idol where the Roman Catholic Church is holding on stall today, where she's the mother in the mother and child uh, vision that they hold close. The same thing happened here. They were already there looking at this woman and saying, we are women, we are crying out because we are not recognized. And there, that is the story here. They, are, they were so wanting to be recognized in the church. But throughout history, unfortunately, the Lord has always gone through men because they are the supposed leader but the next chapter we look at is chapter 9. And here we find that Ezekiel says that the wicked are slain, those who did not receive the mark on their head. Now this is a contrast to what we find in Revelation, where Revelation said, Yes, those people who receive the mark of the beast will be killed. And here Ezekiel says those that have received the mark will not be killed. So we have to look at why. And we have to go back to the exodus from Egypt, where Israel had to mark the doorposts with the blood of Jesus or the blood of the Lamb. And that is what we have to do for those of us who are under the blood of the Lamb, who have chosen to become part of the covenant with the Lord and who have put their lives and trust in the Lord Jesus and come under His blood, we will not be killed. We will continue to live. And that is what chapter 9 is all about. Chapter 10, we find again a vision of what the Lord looked like and we see the Lord actually departing now from Ezekiel. And that was the first part of the vision that Ezekiel saw. Now, I know I've said earlier that yes, he had to lie on his side. I think it was only a vision. I don't think he physically did it. But it was part of the vision that the Lord took him through to, to tell him what is happening and what is going to happen. Then we come to chapter 11. And now we start, and that is what the whole book of Ezekiel is all about. It's all about 
prophecies against people, what is wrong with them. And the main reason, and I think a lot of people say, but we don't want to hear everything that is wrong with us. No, we have to hear what is wrong with us, because only when, once we know what is wrong with us, can we change our lives and fix it and become totally acceptable to the Lord. So if we look at uh, chapter 11, I'll read a couple of verses from verse 15 again. He says, Son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your fellow exiles, and the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those to whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. This land has been given us as a possession. Can we see that the people are saying to everybody else, But we children of Lord, of the God, He's given us this land as a possession. So why would He do something to us? But then the word comes. Uh, Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, Though I had removed them far away among the nations, and though I have scattered them among the countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When they come there, they will remove all the detestable things and all its abominations from it, and I will give them one heart and put a new spirit in them, and I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. But as far as those whose hearts go after <coughs> their detestable things and abominations, I will bring their conduct down on their heads, declares the Lord God. So here we find quite a good word that he says, yes, even if I've scattered you among the nations, and I know we've spoken about the different nations previously in the series, where people will find, we will find people in Egypt, we will find people in Assyria, we will find people in Sidon and Tyre, all over the, uh, the world. He says, I will gather, gather them and bring them back to Jerusalem. And that is a very, very good prophecy, to know that, yes, you might be sitting in the wrong church today if you look at the story that we've gone through or the whole procedure that we have to go through. You might be sitting in Egypt and say, Lord, how do I get out of Egypt? Do I now have to go and be baptized? What is the story? And he says, he will gather you from there if you change your way. So follow him and do everything that he asks of you and then you will be acceptable to him. Now if we go to chapter 12, it's a story that is very difficult to explain to people what the Lord wants from us. He talks about in the verse 12, he says, Thus you will know that I am the Lord, for you have walked in my statues, nor you have entered into my ordinances, but you have acted according to the ordinances of the nations around you. And verse 19, sorry, the wrong chapter. Uh, Verse 12, let's read it again. The prince who is among them will load his baggage on his shoulder in the dark and go out. They will dig a hole in the wall and to bring it out. He will cover his face so that he cannot see the land with his eyes. And then verse 19, he says, Then say to the people of the land, Thus says the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the land of Israel, they will eat their bread at with anxiety and drink their water with horror because their land will be stripped of its fullness and account of the violence of those who live in it. The inhabited cities will be laid waste and the land will be a desolation. So you will know that I am the Lord. Here yeah, the Lord says that the people in Jerusalem will have to go into exile. This in the time of Ezekiel happened because the king was taken blindfolded to uh, the land of the cold uh, to Babylon where he was where he eventually died now the same thing happens to us as Christians we have to come out of our belief system out of holding on to what our church tells us is good we have to come out and say I don't believe in it any longer I now want to trust in what the Lord is doing to us so we have to go into exile we have to come out of this church system 
and go into something where people will say to you, but are you sure that, that it's correct, that it's going to happen? But the freedom that you get once you realize how easy it is to please the Lord, that all you have to do is give your heart to Him and say, Lord, take over, do everything that you want in my life. It is such a blessing. And that's what Ezekiel is saying here as well, is yes, you will go out, because what will happen is Jerusalem will be, as he says in verse uh, 20, the inhabited cities will be laid waste. I just have to look at so many churches today that are laid waste, where people can do whatever they want to do in their churches, and nobody will actually stand up and say, but it's wrong. We don't find it in the Bible. People are, have new doctrines just about every week, and they are never challenged for it. So that is what Ezekiel is talking about here as well. Now, the next thing that happens in Ezekiel is he comes and he talks about the prophets. We look at chapter 13. He says in verse 4, O Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. You have not gone up into the breaches, nor did you build the wall around the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. They see falsehood and lying divinations who are saying, The Lord declares when the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. Did you not see a false vision and speak a lying divination when you said, The Lord declares, but it is not I who have spoken? Yeah, there's two things wrong with prophets. Prophets are supposed to stand in a gap and warn the people. That is what Ezekiel's calling was all about. The Lord said to him, I'm calling you to stand in the gap, to tell people what is wrong, to come out and say to people, this is what is wrong, but also to come to the Lord and say, Lord, don't look at them, look at me. I'm standing in the gap for these people because I'm warning them that the things are wrong. If something goes wrong, then look at me first to see if I've done everything correctly. And that's what he says the prophets are not doing. They're not doing that. They're not standing in the gap for people. They are just standing there and saying, Oh, but the Lord says everything will come right. When, in fact, the Lord didn't say anything to like that. I've seen so many prophecies in churches and at camps where people are saying one thing, but when you stand there and you listen to these so-called prophets, you find that, what they are actually saying is they're just echoing the person in front of them, their requirements, their wishes. They say, yes, you will have a major, major impact on church. And you look at the person, you know that they cannot have a major impact on church. Or you will have this huge ministry just to get them out of there and to feel good and to blow them up and to boost their egos. That is what we find that the prophets are doing today. But we're not finding that they are actually calling people to repentance. And this is what Ezekiel found as well. Now, chapter 14, he goes, and he says in verse 4, Therefore speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, Any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart, puts right before his face the stumbling block of his inequity, and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in the manner in view of the multitude of his idols. Just what I said. If you decide that I really want to do this, and then you go and you go to some other prof school of prophets or go to a prophet at a church, and you go there with a certain requirement that you want a confirmation of that which you think you are supposed to do. The Lord says here, I will give you that confirmation. But it won't be the correct confirmation because you've set it up as an idol. Wait till the Lord tells you what to do and then go and do it. Don't come up and think of all these beautiful ministries that you want to get involved with because the Lord will tell you, yes, that's right, go and do it. But it will not be His will for you. That is what we find wrong here. Now, if we look at verse 14, it says, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the midst, by their own righteousness, 
they could only deliver themselves to declare the Lord God. This is huge in that we find that the Lord says at times in churches, even if they had direct access or if these people were, were there, Noah, Job, and if I'm, you write verse again, 14, uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Even if these people were there, they could only save themselves. Now, we all know that Daniel, uh, Noah, and Job, they are great prophets of the Bible. And the Lord says there are so many abominations in church that even if these three were there, they would only be able to save themselves. They will not be able to save anybody else's lives. So that is what we have to remember, is that we do not go into persistent unfaithfulness. Now, if we look at chapter 15, uh, the Lord looks and gives uh, Ezekiel another vision of a vine. And he says, uh, if a vine is burned, it's not useful to anybody. Because when you look at a piece of vine and it's been burnt on both sides, you cannot graft it onto any other vine. It just will not work. And that is the problem with us today is we became a vine separate and we've been burned on both sides. So we cannot be grafted into the vine that is Jesus Christ. And we have to be cut afresh and to bleed again to be able to be grafted into this vine. Now, chapter 16 is actually a major chapter for us.